Okay, thanks for joining us for uh, tonight's panel discussion uh, on divine simplicity. Um, we're going to follow the order of the papers as they're outlined in the program book. So we'll have Dr. Howe, and then Dr. Davis, and then Dr. Craig, and then Dr. Huffling. Uh, we will reserve all of our Q&A for after the papers are done. And then uh, b between the first two papers and the last two papers, we'll have two short minutes just to stand up, stretch our legs, get some water if you need to. Okay, so uh, the first paper tonight is by Dr. Richard Howe, and it's titled Antecedents to Aquinas' Doctrine of Simplicity. If things go as planned, I will have a copy of this paper posted on my website at richardghow.com. So just give me a little time to straighten out some of the footnotes and just be checking that in the next few years, and it should be there. So I suspect that discussing Aquinas' doctrine of simplicity might strike some as impractical or as uninteresting or as irrelevant as exploring the contours of medieval dentistry. On the other hand, things might be changing in certain circles with a renaissance of interest in Aristotle and Aquinas, the philosophers whose metaphysics has informed the bulk of the discussion on simplicity throughout its history and even today. Aquinas' doctrine of divine simplicity arises out of his maintaining a number of theological and metaphysical doctrines. Some of these doctrines are ideas from previous theologians and philosophers which he incorporated into his own thinking, some with little or no modification, some with important modifications, and some, some that served as counterexamples that spurred him on to make his own metaphysical innovations. Thus, by the term antecedents, I do not mean merely those influences that preceded Thomas Aquinas the thinker. I also mean to include those doctrines that precede his specific doctrine of simplicity. By this broader notion, I mean to include certain ideas that are Aquinas' own, which serve as the context and ingredients of his doctrine of simplicity. While it is manifest that Aquinas' motivations for his thinking and writing were theological and religious, it is equally manifest that infused throughout his writings is his metaphysics. In this paper, I should like to highlight some of these antecedent metaphysical ideas to the end of helping to situate Aquinas' doctrine of simplicity. I dare not hope to convince you that the Aquinas' doctrine is true, but I do hope that by seeing how his doctrine of simplicity arises out of these commitments, we can attenuate the discussion and the critique and in some instances perhaps redirect them. Many have raised objections to the doctrine. We shall perhaps hear some of the more powerful objections here tonight. My aim is to preempt some of those objections by showing that, given the metaphysics that Aquinas holds, the doctrine of simplicity emerges unavoidably. For my purposes, I can only hope to deal only briefly with the most significant of these metaphysical elements of Aquinas' doctrine of simplicity. Before I pick these up, however, I should like to list, with little or no comment, other antecedents to Aquinas' thinking. Theological antecedents, bearing in mind that sometimes the line between philosophy and theology gets blurry, would include, in historical order, Irenaeus, Clement of Alexandria, Origen, Hilary of Pontiers, Basil of Caesarea, that is, Basil the Great, John of Damascus, Peter Abelard, Peter Lombard, and the Fourth Lateran Council. In addition, one might find, by way of interest, certain theological subsequences. Illustrations, I submit, to the enduring influence of Aquinas and these antecedents, particularly in regard to simplicity. These theological subsequences would include, again in historical order, John Calvin, the Waldensian Confession, the Belgic Confession, the 39 Articles, the Irish Articles, John Owen, Francis Turretin, Stephen Charnock, the Westminster Confession of Faith, Faith, the Savoy Declaration, the London Baptist Confession, Charles Hodge, Herman Bavinck, Lewis Berry Chafer, and Lewis Burkhoff. And so in the, in the footnotes, I have citations from each of those with respect specifically to the issue of simplicity. I'm not suggesting that these historical antecedents or subsequences make the doctrine of simplicity true. I am suggesting, however, that they might be flags that, even if the doctrine is false, it is not entirely incoherent as some of its detractors maintain even if it turns out that its coherency is only possible given Aquinas' metaphysical commitments out of which his doctrine of simplicity emerges. 
and a discussion of the coherency of those metaphysical commitments themselves, we'll have to wait for another panel discussion, and then I'd have to take a nap first before we do that one. The thinking of certain philosophers serves as a background to Aquinas' own philosophy in a number of areas, including, by example and counterexample, his doctrine of simplicity. A partial list of these would include, also in historical order, Aristotle, Plotinus, Proclus, particularly the Liber de Causis, the Pseudo Dionysius, specifically his On Divine Names, Augustine, Boethius, Alfarabi, Avicenna, Anselm, Averroes, Maimonides, Philip the Chancellor, Alexander of Hales, William of Auvergne, and Albert the Great. Aquinas' philosophy employs many categories and ideas gleaned from these and other antecedents, some more than others. Aquinas gets much of his metaphysics from Aristotle. He was, in very many ways, an Aristotelian. But while certain of these Aristotelian doctrines are necessary for Aquinas' doctrine of simplicity, they're not sufficient. Doctrines deepened or developed by Aquinas together with additional philosophical doctrines added by him, though not themselves also without antecedent, both by example and counterexample, will be what turned the pagan philosophy of Aristotle into the Christian philosophy of Aquinas. A list of these metaphysical doctrines, only a few about which I'll be able to make comments, include, this time in a more or less logical or metaphysical order, act and potency, efficient, formal, material, and final causality, exemplar causality, form and matter, Aristotle's five predicables, genus, species, specific difference, proper accident and accident, Aristotle's ten categories, substance, quantity, quality, relation, time, uh, space, habitus, action, and passion, analogy of being, existence, the essence-existence distinction, and the transcendentals. For Aquinas, to say that God is simple is just to say that God is not composed in any way. For him, there is a, are a number of ways in which a being can be composed. In his Summa Theologia, he asks whether God is a body, whether God is composed of form and matter, whether God is, in this, is the same as his essence or nature, whether essence and existence are the same in God, whether God is contained in a genus, whether in God there are any accidents, and whether God is altogether simple. In this last point, Aquinas gives a more global defense of simplicity by examining the notion of composition as such. From Aquinas' On the Power of God, written before the Summa Theologia, we can add to the discussion whether good, just, wise, and the like predicate an accident in God, whether the aforesaid terms signify the divine essence, whether these terms are synonymous. Aquinas then rounds out the treatment of simplicity here with a robust discussion of relations with respect to God and creatures. Of the different aspect of Aquinas' doctrine of simplicity, I suspect most would regard Aquinas' notion of existence and the essence-existence distinction as the most relevant. Thus, I should like to start with these and then introduce any of the others when necessary and as time allows to help us appreciate what Aquinas is doing with his doctrine of simplicity and why it emerges as it does in his overall metaphysics. Aquinas' understanding of existence, though clearly influenced by certain philosophical antecedents, is, is nevertheless a profound innovation and serves, according to certain schools of Thomistic thought, as the key to his entire metaphysics one which makes all the difference between him and Aristotle, despite Aquinas' tremendous indebtedness to him. Aristotle's highest category in his metaphysics is form, or if you will, essence. To be is to be form. That is to say, Aristotle does not have a philosophical category of existence. And I'm skipping some of the citations that try to make that argument for the sake of time that you'll be able to get from the paper. Aristotle is not alone here, for there does not seem to be a distinctive philosophical doctrine of existence as such in any ancient Greek philosophy, and thus no notion of an existence-essence distinction among the ancient Greeks. Key texts where Aquinas lays out his understanding of existence and the essence-existence distinction are in his On Being and Essence, Truth, On the Power of God, and the Summa Theologia. The essence-existence distinction maintains that there is a real distinction in a created thing between its essence and its existence. A thing's essence is what it is, its existence is that it is. Consider yourself as a human being. Your essence is what makes you a human, your existence is what makes you a being. 
That essence and existence are distinct in sensible objects, that is, object, objects evident to the senses, uh, is evident from the fact that one can understand the essence of a thing without knowing whether it exists. Aquinas argues in On Being in Essence, quote, Now every essence can be understood without knowing anything about its being. I can know, for instance, what a man or a phoenix, and notice he picks a, a real object and a fictional object, what a man or a phoenix is, and still be ignorant whether it has being in reality. From this it is clear that being is other than essence, unless perhaps there is a reality whose quiddity or essence is its being, unquote. For Aquinas, God's simplicity emerges finally from the fact that there is no distinction between God's essence and existence. The full import of the essence-existence distinction is easily missed, however, until Aquinas' notion of existence is unpacked. Once one appreciates what Aquinas says about existence, then, when coupled with the real distinction between essence and existence, one can be see, begin to see its profound implications for the existence and attributes of the God of classical theism. Several aspects of Aquinas' understanding of esse, the Latin term often translated as existence in English, though it's an infinitive in, in Latin, uh, should be noted. <clears throat> These observations should be primarily taken in terms of how Aquinas understands created realities. First, for Aquinas, existence or esse is an act. In thinking about sensible objects, existence is what essences do or more to the point, something that essences have done to them. This relationship between the act of existence, or if you will, the act of existing, and the essence of a thing is the relationship of act and potency that Aquinas gets from Aristotle. Definitionally, act or actuality is to be real, whereas potency is the power or capacity to be actual or real. As a capacity, it is said to be in a substance or thing. As such, a potency cannot exist on its own, but can only exist as a potency, with scare quotes around the word exist there, that is possessed by an existing thing, that is a thing in act. And, I, and in the footnotes I deal with another sense of potency that, that is, uh, is important here, but for the sake of time I'm going to skip it. But you can get that from the footnotes. To be in act is to be real. Joseph, so Joseph Owen summarizes, quote, when existence is considered in relation to the thing it makes exist, it may be regarded as actualizing the thing, and accordingly, it appears as the actuality that gives the thing existence." Unquote. Second, Aquinas' notion of existence entails that the existing of a created thing is continuously being caused. By way of illustration, <clears throat> suppose you were seeing, let's say, a glass ball, a big giant glass ball, and you might ask, well, where did this giant glass ball come from? And if someone said, well, there's a factory nearby and they created this and they dragged it down here for a promotional, you know, grand opening of a retail establishment, blah, 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 you'd likely be satisfied. And you would be satisfied even if you knew nothing else particularly about the factory that made it. And for that matter, whether the factory even continued to exist, you still feel satisfied with the explanation of its cause. But contrast that, by way of illustration, with hearing music. With the music, you would not ask, well, where did that music come from, or what caused the music? Instead, you would ask, what is causing the music? Because you realize that music, as music, is music only as it is being caused to be music. And that at any moment when the cause of the music stops causing the music, the music just ceases to exist. So in a parallel way, this is how Aquinas regards existence in creatures. As that which actualizes an essence, that essence exists only as it is being caused to continually be actualized. If the cause of the existence of the essence stops causing the existence of the essence, the essence goes out of existence. Thus for Aquinas, if the existence of a thing is not due to what it is, which is to say if its existence is not due to its essence, and you should note here that this is referring to anything where its existence is distinct from its essence, then that thing only could be existing because it is continually being caused to exist by something for which there is no essence-existence distinction. That thing must be substantial existence itself, ipsum esse subsistence. That thing needs nothing to give it existence. It instead gives existence to everything else. 
The creation has existence. The creator is existence. Third for Aquinas, existence as such contains all perfections. Note that perfection here is not an exclusively moral one. While moral perfection can be, indeed must be, according to Aquinas, parsed out with this category, here perfection is a broader notion. For the most part, to perfect something is to actualize the potency in a thing, sending it towards fully becoming what it is. Aristotle used these terms interchangeably, inorgizomai or energia for actualize or actual, and then intelikia for perfection. That perfection is an apt word to use in this context, as argued by Joseph Owens. Quote, an alternative word for actuality in this respect is perfection or intelikia. It was used by Aristotle along with actuality to designate the formal elements in the things. These perfected the material element in the sense of fulfilling its potentiality in completing the thing. Since existence is required to complete the thing and all the formal elements and activities, it may be aptly called the perfection of all perfections." Unquote. These notions of continuing or current causality, that is, existence as an act, and existence as possessing all perfections, are crucial to understanding the whole of Aquinas' metaphysics. Their value is how they philosophically deliver for Aquinas both the existence of God and all of the classical attributes of God, except those attributes contained exclusively in revealed truth, like, for example, the Trinity. Exactly how they're employed in an argument for God's existence is a topic that will wait for another occasion, and I've already sort of touched on the kernel of that by what I've said earlier. How they employ as a demonstration of the classical attributes of God, however, is more germane to the topic of simplicity. In the Summa Theologia, the order of argument, after a few preliminary considerations, is the demonstration of God's existence, his famous five ways in question two, then the demonstration of God's simplicity in question three, and then the demonstration of the remaining classical attributes of God in questions four through twenty-five. It is no accident that simplicity stands as a fountainhead for the rest of God's attributes. For Aquinas, such attributes are tethered together like so many buoys on a ship. If one is thrown overboard, the rest will inevitably follow. They all stand or fall together. How then should one understand the relationship between existence and perfections? Consider this illustration which I borrowed from the philosopher Max Herrera. When one blows up a balloon, the air expands to fill the balloon up to the extent of and according to the shape of the balloon. By parallel, the essay or the act of existing of a creature fills up the form or essence of the creature to the extent of and according to the shape of the form or essence of that creature. Thus, a horse contains all the perfections of existence up to the extent of and according to the limitations of the essence of horse. A human contains all the perfections of existence up to the extent of and according to the perfections of the essence of human. Since in God there is no essence existence distinction, then all the perfections of existence are in God because God's being is not conjoined with and thus not limited by form. He is his own form or his own being. As Aquinas puts it, quote, God is absolute form or rather absolute being, unquote. He argues that a being whose essence is essay or existence possesses all perfections in superabundance. As he says it, quote, all perfections existing in creatures divided and multiplied preexist in God unitedly, unquote. Now, not to adventure into Brian's topic for this evening, I would like to address one objection that will give me occasion to say something about existence vis-a-vis -vis certain other of these philosophical antecedents. Some have argued that if God is his own existence, that is, if there is no essence existence distinction in God, then this makes God completely empty of content, likened unto a Buddhist abyss or a Hindu absolute. This objection seems to be taking Aquinas' notion of existence as if existence was for him a genus or a universal. <clears throat> the thinking would go like this. Take the individual Socrates 
consider the fact that Socrates is human. Note the differences between an individual human and the category human. And here I'm not implying anything regarding the metaphysics of human, as for example in the realism-nominalism debate. Regardless of how one might uh, take the status of the category human here in contradistinction to the individual human, it remains that Socrates is a member, if you will, of the category, or however you want to designate the, the different layers, human. Now consider that human is animal. Last, add to the layers by noting that animal is living thing. With each step through the layers from Socrates to human to animal to living thing, as the category becomes more inclusive, which is to say, as the category expands to greater extent over its members, the property commitments of the category become fewer. Become fewer. The, the fact that Socrates lived in ancient Greece is irrelevant to him being a human. He would be no less human if he was living in the United States today. To be sure that Socrates was a real human as opposed to a fictional character entails that he lived at some time and some place, but the specific time and place is not entailed by his being human. Thus, the category human has to be free from the particular or individuating constraints of specific times and places that obtain with being an individual human. What is more, the fact that Socrates is rational distinguishes him as a certain kind of animal. Thus, the category of animal cannot contain the specific difference of rational. Otherwise, slugs, for example, would not be animals, or either that or more likely, every animal would be human if the category of animal contained the attribute rational. We can see a similar way of thinking regarding living thing. To be an animal is to be a living thing, but the category of living thing is free from the constraints of being animal so as to include, for example, plants. What this shows us is that as one ascends up the scale of the layers, the categories become more encompassing as to which members it includes, while at the same time they become emptier of specifying content. The significance of this for our purposes is what this might say about existence. Existence, it would seem, is the broadest of all categories. Everything that is real exists. Given that this makes it the broadest possible category within reality, it must be, so the reasoning goes, the emptiest of all categories so as to include everything in it, if you will, to include all ten of Aristotle's categories. George Klubertant summarizes, quote, Genus is always abstract, and the wider and more universal the genus, the more abstract and potential it is. For example, material universe is a predicate that can be applied to everything in our material universe. It is also very abstract and is in potency to all specific determinations like living, sensitive, or rational." Unquote. But why does this not make the objector's point? If, be, if being is indifferent to any of the ten categories, does this not mean that it is missing those characteristics? Is this not exactly what a genus is? Does it not then need to be delimited somehow in order to give it content? Not at all. Aristotle explains, quote, but it is not possible that being should be a single genus of things, for the differentia of any genus must have being. But it's not possible for the genus, taken apart from its species, to be predicated of its proper differentia, so that if being is a genus, no differentia would have being." Unquote. Aquinas concurs, quote, "...since the existence of God is His essence, if God were in any genus, He would be the genus being." because since genus is predicated as an essential, it refers to the essence of a thing. But the philosopher has shown that being cannot be a genus, for every genus has differences distinct from its generic essence. Now, no difference can exist distinct from being, for non-being cannot be a difference. It follows then that God is not in a genus." Unquote. It is not possible for being to be delimited such that it is given content that it somehow does not already have. For whatever one might postulate as a delimiter, for example, let's say form, it itself must have some modicum of existence or being in order to be a delimiter in the first place. But if it has being, then being is ontologically prior to the delimiter and to its delimiting. This becomes either self-refuting 
or involves an infinite regress such that nothing is ever delimited. Gavin Kerr comments, quote, When it comes to pure essay, it is not the case that essay indeterminately signifies all the things that could possibly be and therefore stands to be determined by something distinct from itself. Pure essay is precisely what it is to be. Accordingly, anything not envisioned by pure essay is precisely an impossibility of being and beyond the scope of being." Unquote. Consider then the rest of Klubertanz's point from above. But being, as it is understood in the first and, and proper metaphysical sense, is named from that which is most actual and concrete, namely the act of existing. Being is not the widest in extension and the least in comprehension, because the logical rule of the inverse variation of extension and comprehension holds only for universals. Being is at once the widest in extension, for is can be said of all things, and the fullest in implicit comprehension, for any real act or perfection is." Unquote. <clears throat> so what is the problem here? In my estimation, this is a confusion of genus, and for that matter the five predicables, with what came to be known in the 13th century as the Transcendentals. The doctrine of the Transcendentals began to congeal through the thinking of Philip the Chancellor, who's, who's uh, the late 1100s, early 1200s, uh, Alexander of Hales, and Albert the Great. With, his, with many points introduced, time will not allow a fair exploration of the doctrine, as with many of the points, time will not allow a fair exploration of the, of the doctrine of the Transcendentals. Let it suffice to say this much. The transcendentals are attributes, for lack of a better word here, that transcend the ten categories of Aristotle inasmuch as all ten of the categories participate, admittedly a philosophically loaded term, in all the transcendentals. The ten categories are modes, if you will, of being, which is to say they are a way of being real in the sensible world. Since being itself is infused through all ten categories, it transcends them since it itself is not confined to any of them specifically. The transcendentals would include being, one, true, good, and in some lists, beautiful. They are the attributes of being as such. Having introduced the doctrine of the transcendentals in order to give some closure to our considerations of all the metaphysical notions out of which Aquinas' doctrine of simplicity emerges, one might think that I've created more questions and problems than I've answered and solved. Aquinas' overall consideration is that the transcendentals are attributes that are infused, my word, through all created being. Does this make the transcendentals God? His answer is no. Instead, God is substantial being, ipsum esse subsistence, that is the cause of all other reality and who is himself beyond the constraints of finite being. As such, the transcendentals, uh, as, as attributes of finite being, find their reality from God, who is existence, truth, and goodness itself. From this and other things that need to be said, but will go without saying here, one can come to see in Aquinas how it is that the classical attributes of God, perfection, goodness, infinity, immutability, eternity, unity, omniscience, life, will, love, justice, mercy, providence, and omnipotence cascade inexorably from simplicity. To be sure, some contemporary philosophers of religion have contended for certain of these attributes by means quite different from the classical and medieval metaphysics of Thomas Aquinas. But as evidenced here tonight, not all of these classical, classical attributes have survived these contemporary means. Whether that is a good or bad thing for Christian theism, I will, for the time being, leave it to you to decide. Thank you. Okay, next we have Dr. Stephen T. Davis, Why Simplicity is Unnecessary. The doctrine of divine simplicity says that God is metaphysically simple. That is, God has no physical or metaphysical parts. Indeed, God, in God there is no complexity at all. That's the basic idea. But several corollaries follow from it. First, God has no physical parts or composition. Second, unlike human beings, and indeed unlike all physical objects, God's essence is God's existence. God is existence itself. Third, no distinction can be made between any of God's various attributes because God is identical to each of God's intrinsic properties. Fourth, there is no contingency in God. All God's intrinsic properties are essential properties. 
And fifth, God is a, a, not a member of any class or set, not even the set of beings or things. It is clear that the doctrine of divine simplicity is puzzling, and it is puzzling in at least two ways. First, it is difficult to come to understand the doctrine. Honestly, I think you can break your head thinking about it. Second, it's difficult, at least for me, to grasp why its defenders believe that the doctrine is needed. Indeed, some hold that the doctrine of divine simplicity is the linchpin of everything else that Christians want to say about God, as, as Richard correctly said in the big summa when he gets to divine attributes. Uh, simplicity is the very first thing that he talks about. In the present essay, I am not going to argue that the doctrine of divine simplicity is incoherent. Honestly, I suspect that in the end it is, although in recent years, supporters of the doctrine of divine simplicity have skillfully defended it against several criticisms, and I'm thinking of people here like Brouwer, Lefto, Rogers, and Stump. After making a preliminary point and explaining my basic assumptions, I will instead attack what I take to be the two main motivations for the doctrine. I will first briefly argue against Aquinas' implicit claim that if there is any complexity in God, there must be some potentiality in God, and that since God is pure act, that is impossible. I will then argue in much more detail that the doctrine of divine simplicity is not needed to protect what Christians want to say about divine transcendence over all of the creation. Here is the preliminary point, which I'm not going to explore in any detail. I strongly suspect that the doctrine is inconsistent with other things Christians must say about God, for example, that God is a trinity. Now, I am aware that defenders of the doctrine argue that the three Trinitarian persons do not amount to proper parts of God. Perhaps they are right about that. But the doctrine of divine simplicity makes a stronger claim than that, than that God has no proper parts. As noted, it claims that in God there is no complexity at all. God is, as Jeffrey Brower puts it, completely devoid of any metaphysical complexity. And as we just heard from Richard, God is not composed in any way. And honestly, I do not see how believers in the orthodox doctrine of the divine trinity can say that. In this essay, I am making three assumptions. First and most importantly, I assume that God is the creator of all contingent things and thus is radically different from all of them. If God is not transcendent, we are not talking about the Christian God. On the other hand, some theologians, perhaps under the influence of what I regard as Anselm's brilliant idea that God is not just the greatest actual being, but the greatest conceivable being or possible being, these people try to push transcendence as far as it can possibly go. There is, as some of them say, Kierkegaard, for example, Karl Barth, there is an infinite qualitative difference between God and the creatures. And I'm going to resist that notion. I do not think an infinite distance can be crossed or bridged, not even by an omnipotent being. If it were true that the distance between God and humans was infinite, we could have no knowledge of God whatsoever. My second assumption is that God is a necessary being, has a seity. A necessary being first exists and cannot not exist, that is, its possibility entails its existence. Second, it depends on no other thing for its existence. Third, it is everlasting in the sense of never failing to exist. I am a contingent being because I have a finite lifespan and because when I exist, I depend on other things, both for my coming into existence, that is, my parents, and for my continuing existence, the air I breathe and the food I eat. God, as the first cause of all contingent existence, is not like that. God is metaphysically independent. My third assumption is that human beings can make true positive statements about God. For example, God is good or God is powerful. Because of the huge difference between ourselves and God, however, we do not fully or even really very much understand those statements, but they are true nonetheless. We are not limited to negative statements like God is not a horse. The via negativa, in my opinion, does not tell us enough about God. Now we can deal with what I call the first motivation for the doctrine of divine simplicity briefly. It is this, Aquinas and his followers seem to hold 
that if there is any complexity in God, then there is also potentiality in God. It is, but it is an absolutely crucial belief of Aquinas that there is no potentiality in God. God is already everything that God can possibly be. God cannot potentially be wiser or more compassionate or more powerful than God is and always, always has been. Well, I agree with that. It goes without saying that there is no potentiality in God so far as God's intrinsic properties are concerned. God is not growing wiser or kinder. But it seems clear to me, well, since I do not accept divine timelessness, that there must be a kind of, a kind of potentiality in God, what we might call extrinsic potentiality. Surely we can say that now, that God is now potentially but not actually in the state of knowing, for example, that Jesus has returned or that the last judgment has occurred. But I will leave that point aside since believer, believers in the doctrine of divine simplicity are also believers in divine timelessness and that very much complicates the point. I could talk about that if you want, but, but I won't here. I will just do not see why, complex, I just want to say that I do not see why complexity in God entails potentiality in God's intrinsic properties. If someone could spell that point out, argue that the one logically follows from the other, I might be convinced. But I do not think that has been done. It certainly does not follow that if God has n number of parts, then possibly God has n plus one number of parts. What then is the second and more crucial motivation for the doctrine of divine simplicity? What is, um, what is it that most deeply drives such luminaries as Augustine, Aquinas, Anselm, the other folks that Richard correctly mentioned, and his contemporary defenders to embrace the idea that God is metaphysically simple. It is clearly the desire to protect the divine difference from and transcendence over all of creation. God's aseity, God's status as a necessary being, and God's status as the first cause, to the extent that these three are different from each other, not, they're not really, are all designed to do that very thing. The basic insight of defenders of the doctrine is that no complex object can be a first cause, a necessary being, or exist a se, that is from itself. I don't agree with that claim. Now at the risk of naively ignoring important hermeneutical issues, let me cite various texts from, the, from scripture that have led Christians to stress the huge difference between God and the creatures. Such texts apparently entail that God is far greater than and superior to the whole of creation. God is not like a powerful and grand human being, and we are quite unable to comprehend fully God and God's essence. Now I'm going to skip over the paragraph that argues from scripture that God is transcendent. Um, and I've quoted a whole lot of passages from, from scripture, and I don't think that's in question in this debate anyway that we're having today. So I'm going to skip over that for the sake of time. Let's go to the second one, God is imminent. But we must not miss the fact that there is also ample scriptural, scriptural support for the idea of similarities or close relationships between God and human beings. God is imminent. Let me mention four items. First, human beings were created in, in God's image, as we learned from Genesis 1. There have been countless discussions and disagreements in the tradition over what the image of God consists in. I will not try to solve that problem here. Suffice it to say that the notion certainly seems minimally to suggest that we human beings are similar to God in some important ways. And since, quote, being similar to, end quote, is a, sim is a symmetrical relation, symmetrical relation, that is, if A is similar to B, then B is similar to A, it follows that we are similar, if we are similar to God in some ways, then God is similar to us in some ways. Second, God is personal. I know that it never says in scripture God is a person, but nevertheless, it's clear that God is personal. The notion did not, this notion denies all views in which an impersonal absolute is ultimate reality, like Brahman or the Dharma or the Tao or absolute emptiness in Zen. It also implies that God, like us, is a person, not of course in the same way that we are persons, but that is God is a being who has knowledge, memory, and desires and who formulates intentions and works to achieve them. It also means that unlike the absentee, absentee God of, 18th century de, of the 18th century deists, God lovingly cares, cares about the creation and works in it to achieve his purposes for it. Third, God does not remain silent. Rather, God reveals himself to us. 
God speaks a word that humans can comprehend, a revelation that in part consists in human words. God chooses to reveal himself to human beings by being involved in human life and history. The purpose of revelation is the accomplishment of God's purposes. Preeminently, in my opinion, God desires that human beings come to obey, worship, and love God. Christians hold that it is preeminently through Christ that this can happen. And fourth, in the incarnation of Christ, God became one of us and lived on earth as a man. Accordingly, we can learn about God by learning about Jesus. So God is both transcendent and imminent. Some theologies give precedence to one side or the other. Anyone who wants to push divine transcendence as far as possible may well be inclined toward the doctrine of divine simplicity. That doctrine surely amounts to maximal transcendence. The danger of going too far in the direction of transcendence is the danger that God becomes hidden, unreachable, and irrelevant to human life and concerns. For example, the gods of the ancient Epicureans were ideal exemplars of ataraxia, calm, serenity, imperturbability, but they lived far away from the earth and had nothing to do with human affairs. The god of 18th century deism, who it was said created the world and its natural laws and processes, but never interfered thereafter, also seems too transcendent. So the danger of going too far toward transcendence is that we arrive at a God who has little to do with us and about whom we can know little. The danger of going too far in the direction of imminence is either anthropomorphism or idolatry, or both. In the present context, anthropomorphism is the tendency to reduce the creator to a creature, to suppose that God is very much like human beings. The ancient Greek pantheon, for example, was anthropomorphic. Gods like Zeus, Athena, and Ares were indeed far more powerful than human beings, and at least according to Homer, most importantly, did not have to die, but in most other ways, they were similar to human beings. The god or gods of contemporary Latter-day Saint theology are also, in my opinion, not transcendent enough. Sensible Christian thinking about God, so it seems to me, must be done in tension, so to speak, between the apparently opposing poles of transcendence and imminence. It is essential for Christians to hold that both sorts of claims are true and that neglect of one side over the other leads to error. God is both transcendent and imminent. The one must not detract from the other. What follows from the claim that God is both transcendent and imminent? If I can put it this way, it follows that God must be radically different from the creation, but not too different. Of course, none of the divine perfections, for example, omnipotence, omniscience, perfect goodness, are shared with human beings. Still, there must be some commensurability between God and human beings. Otherwise, God would have nothing to do with us by revealing himself to us, for example, or us with God by our praying to God, for example. Is it possible to deny the doctrine of divine transcendence and still firmly hold on to transcendence? the doctrine of divine simplicity, sorry, and still hold on firmly to transcendence. Is it possible, that is, for a complex God to be a necessary being, to exist a se, to be the first cause, that is, the creator? It seems clear to me that the answer to that is yes. But one big barrier remains. It's a crucial and rather technical point made by Aquinas and repeated uh, occasionally in the literature to the effect that, quote, Every composite thing is posterior to its components and is dependent on them, end quote. And it is certainly true that all created things are complex and are, depend and are dependent on their parts. Let's bite the bullet. Let's assume that God is complex. To keep things simple, God, we will say, consists of two parts, part A and part B. Does the above inference from Aquinas that every composite thing is posterior to its parts and depends on them follow in this case? Well, there are two claims being ma made here, I think. The first is, m uh, 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 I can wrap up in this question, must a composite thing be posterior to its parts? I assume Aquinas intends a kind of logical or explanatory posteriority here. As for example, in the sense in which in modus ponens, if A then B and A, are logically prior to B. And it is true that many times we understand or explain the parts of things before we understand or explain the thing. 
but of course that is not always true. Most of us certainly understand what space is well before we know its dividing points or intervals. Nor is, this, is it true in this case. If God is composite, God is clearly, lo clearly logically prior to God's components. God is obviously not built up out of parts, rather the any parts that are there exist only because God exists. The second claim that seems to be implied there in Aquinas' trenchant quote is, uh, can be wrapped up in this question, if God is a composite thing in the way that we are hypothesizing, part A and part B, must God depend on parts A and B? Well, no, not, at, not in any theologically or metaphysically untoward way. Recall that God is a necessary being. Moreover, all God's parts are essential to God, and God's parts cannot possibly separate, be separated from each other or from God. So the inference does not follow. Nor, if God is a necessary being, is any explanation required as to why God's parts are related to each other and to God in the ways that they are. It is simply an essential aspect of reality that God's parts are related to each other and to God as they are. <coughs> are the two parts, part A and part B, ontologically distinct from God? Well, yes, if that just means they are conceptually distinct, is that a problem? No, not if they are, as I say, essential parts of God and have no possible separate existence. Could, does God depend on part A and part B for God's existence or nature? Of course not. God is a necessary being. God does not depend on God's parts in the way that we depend on ours. Is it true that if A and B did not exist, God would not exist? I suppose conceptually, yes, but it's not possible for A, B, and God not to exist. Someone might object that given what I've just argued, part a, parts A and B are not really parts at all because they do not differ from each other. Not at all, so I reply. They are indeed, indeed distinct. Part A is not the same thing as part B. Part A is not the same thing as God. And part B is not the same, the same thing as God. God consists of parts of part A and part B, perhaps plus other components, since I have not claimed that part A and part B together exhaust God. Well, my claim in the present paper is a modest one. I have been arguing that a complex God can be the first cause, a necessary being, and have a seity. If that is true, the major motivation for the doctrine of divine simplicity is not compelling. I am not claiming that a metaphysically simple God cannot be imminent and related to the world and to human beings in the appropriate way. Although that may be true, I have presented no arguments today along that line. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll have Dr. William Lane Craig, and the topic of his paper is Objections to Divine Simplicity. It seems to me that the question of divine simplicity is not whether God is simple, but whether divine simplicity is best understood along Thomistic lines. What is distinctive of the Thomistic construal is that God's essence just is the act of being subsisting, ipsum esse subsistens, and that therefore God is simple and incomprehensible. Consider three typical objections lodged against the Thomistic construal of divine simplicity. One, the Thomistic construal is unbiblical. One of my greatest misgivings about the Thomistic doctrine is that it is not merely unsupported by biblical teaching, but in contradiction to it. The roots of Thomas's doctrine are to be found not in the Bible, but in Neoplatonism. For thinkers like Proclus and Plotinus, the One is an absolutely undifferentiated unity from which all multiplicity derives. By contrast, in the Bible God is described as a positive being who has properties like holiness, power, eternality, goodness, personhood, and so on. Whereas divine attributes like omnipotence, omnipresence, eternality, holiness, and so on find support in the biblical text, there is no support for the attribute of Thomistic simplicity. Aquinas' treatment of Exodus 3.14, I am that I am, is a classic case of eisegesis. If this statement in the mind of the Pentateuchal author was meant to be a metaphysically heavy statement, 
rather than just a way of saying, don't stick your nose into things that don't concern you, then why not take it as a proof text of divine aseity, or self-existence, or metaphysical necessity, broadly logically necessary existence. Aquinas reads his thesis of the identity of divine essence and existence into, not out of, the passage. The terrible consequence of Thomism is that all of the wonderful biblical attributes of God for which we worship him are annihilated by divine simplicity. Since the pure act of being is not delimited by any essence, God becomes an unintelligible blank. The doctrine of Thomism thus bears much more resemblance to the doctrine of the absolute in religions like Hinduism and Buddhism than to the biblical doctrine of God. As a result, God is no longer religiously accessible except through mystical experience. Two, Thomistic uh, simplicity um, makes God unintelligible. It is often said that since on Thomism God is identical to his properties and all his properties are identical to one another, Thomism threatens to make God a property. But this is absurd since a property is not a living person as God is. The Thomist can escape this unwelcome reduction by maintaining that, in a sense, God is not identical to his essence. Rather, he really has no essence. He just is the pure act of being and hence not identical to any property. But that is precisely the problem. The pure act of being is inconceivable because it has no properties. Thomism thus entails a profound agnosticism about God. We can say only what God is not, not what he is. We really have no idea what we are talking about. Thomists insist that through analogical predication we can do more than say what God is not, but can often affirm that also affirm that he is intelligent, living, providential, personal, powerful, and so on. The problem with this response is that these positive predicates cannot be univocally ascribed to God on Thomism. Being at best analogical predications, they have no univocal content that is true of God. God is not really personal, nor does he love you, nor is he active in the world, for the pure act of being has no properties and stands in no real relations. Three, Thomistic simplicity brings about a modal collapse. Since God is absolutely similar across all possible worlds, never knowing or doing anything differently, modal distinctions collapse and there is in effect only one possible world. God can have no contingent knowledge or action, for everything about him is essential to him. Since God knows that P is logically equivalent to P is true, the necessity of the former entails the necessity of the latter. Thus divine simplicity leads to an extreme fatalism according to which everything that happens does so with logical necessity. Thomas tries to avert this unwelcome consequence by claiming that while creatures are really related to God, God is not really related to creatures. Thus God can be absolutely similar across possible worlds even though creatures vary wildly. The same cognitive state of God counts in one world as the knowledge that I have created creatures and in another world as I have not created creatures. Though God's will and knowledge do not vary from world to world, creatures vary 
in their relations to the simple God. Wholly apart from the question of its intelligibility, the problem with this doctrine is that it makes the existence of creatures inexplicable, since God is absolutely the same in a possible world in which no creatures exist as he in a, is in a world chock full of creatures, the explanation of the difference cannot be found in God, but neither can it be found in creatures, since they come too late in the order of explanation to account for why they exist or not. It follows that on Thomism there just is no explanation of the existence of creatures or the differences between possible worlds, which seems absurd. Now in light of these objections, it seems to me imperative that we retrace our steps and ask ourselves where things went wrong. It seems to me that the most plausible candidate for the crucial misstep is Aquinas' affirmation of a real distinction between essence and existence. It is this that lies at the root of the causal regress that terminates in something that is uncomposed of essence and existence, but just is existence itself. Why think that things are metaphysically composed of essence and existence? It might be said that there must be a real distinction between essence and existence because we can contemplate things' natures without knowing whether or not they exist. But this suffices to show only a conceptual distinction between essence and existence. We can abstract from a thing the fact of its existence as well as its non-defining properties and contemplate its nature alone. Compare the case of properties. On Aquinas' view, properties are mere entia rationis, not mind-independent realities. They are formed by the minds abstracting from an object everything except for the particular feature in question. They are no more really distinct things than, say, the southern exposure of a house is a thing distinct from the house. Thus we have been given no good reason for thinking that things are really composed of essence and existence. But deny the real distinction between essence and existence and the nerve of Thomism is cut. Finally, that leads then to the question, how ought we to understand divine simplicity? Well, what about this? We reject constituent ontologies. We should not think of things as metaphysically composed in any way. In this sense, everything is simple, but there are still positive predications true of them, including God. If we want, we can strengthen divine simplicity by adding that God is not composed of separable parts. That suffices for a biblical and philosophically intelligible doctrine of divine simplicity. God is neither metaphysically composed nor does he have separable parts. The Thomistic interpretation of divine simplicity is not essential to Christian theology. To be sure, the Catholic Church, like the Protestant Reformers, affirms divine simplicity. The Fourth Lateran Council declares God to be absolutely simple, and the First Vatican Council completely simple. But neither council cashes out these expressions in Thomistic terms. Their statements are consistent with interpretations of divine simplicity that are not committed to the radical Thomistic theses that God has no properties but is the pure act of being, unconstrained by any essence, or that God stands in any real relations to the world. Catholics and Protestants alike who balk at these claims should feel free to embrace a different understanding of divine simplicity than that offered by Aquinas.
Okay, our fourth uh, paper is by uh, Dr. Brian Huffling, and his uh, title is Responding to Objections to Divine Simplicity. All right, well, good evening, and thank you for being with us tonight to discuss this fun and interesting topic. Divine simplicity has come under heavy criticism in the past few decades. There are many reasons for this, at least one major reason being that those who hold to divine simplicity have certain metaphysical commitments that those who deny divine simplicity do not. Further, many today take divine simplicity to be held in order to solve problems. For example, Alvin Plantinga maintains that many adhere to divine simplicity in order to protect God's sovereignty and aseity. Those who hold to divine simplicity from a robust Thomistic viewpoint, however, do so because they believe God is pure act and thus cannot have any differentiation, parts, or accidents whatsoever. This is different than holding to divine simplicity in order to solve other problems. For Thomas, divine simplicity is not a starting point, but a conclusion of metaphysical analysis. Thus, it should be noted that not only are there objections to the doctrine, there are differing motivations for it and not all are equal. Defenders of simplicity have anticipated many of these criticisms. For example, two of the strongest objections against the doctrine is that it would lead to a denial of differing attributes in God and that whatever comes to pass must do so of necessity. These objections have been anticipated at least since Aquinas who raised and responded to them in the 13th century. In this paper, I want to primarily focus on these two objections, namely that God can't have more than one attribute if simplicity is true, and the so-called modal collapse objection, which relates to God's knowledge and will. Before looking at these two objections, I will quickly address a few others that are usually invoked. It is often objected that divine simplicity is not taught in the Bible. I do not disagree with this objection, and defenders of divine simplicity do not usually argue from the Bible alone to defend it. We do maintain that the Bible is consistent with divine simplicity, but it is not explicitly taught in Scripture. Because of this fact, some argue that divine simplicity is based in Greek pagan philosophy. It is true, of course, that divine simplicity has roots in Platonism and Aristotelianism. However, to dismiss divine simplicity for this reason is problematic for at least two reasons. One, it commits to genetic fallacy, and two, almost every philosophical position can be traced to Greek thinking. God being temporal or not, passable or not, simple or not, all have links to Greek thinking. To judge the truth of this doctrine, we have to look further than to its roots. Many object that simplicity is incompatible with the Trinity. Such is only the case if, the, if one holds to a part-whole relationship, such as Trinity monotheism. Such a view holds that no person of the Trinity is divine as such, but only when taken with the whole regarding such, uh, regarding such a view. J.P. Moreland and William Lane Craig state, Now obviously the persons are not parts of God in the sense in which a skeleton is part of a cat, but given that the Father, for example, is not the whole Godhead, it seems undeniable that there is some sort of part-whole relation obtaining between the persons of the Trinity and the entire Godhead. Myriologically speaking, we can think of the Trinity as an individual composed of individuals, just as a wall is composed of stones." End quote. However, if the persons are not parts, then there must be further demonstration as to why the Trinity violates divine simplicity. Those who held to simplicity such as Augustine, Anselm, and Aquinas did not see an obvious problem with the two being compossible. We can argue as to whether or not their individual models succeed in maintaining orthodoxy. However, apart from the persons being declared parts, divine simplicity is not obviously violated since such would only be the case if there were parts in God. A standard objection to divine simplicity is that if it were true, there could not be different properties said of God. However, it is said that there are many properties said of God. For example, omniscience is not the same as omnipotence, goodness, or mercy. Therefore, divine simplicity is false. There are several lines of response to such an objection. Before looking at them, I want to point out that this objection was anticipated and addressed by Aquinas in his Summa Theologiae, Part 1, Question 13, Article 4, and Summa Contra Gentiles, Book 1, Chapter 31. Thus, this is not a new objection. One issue that should be clarified immediately regarding God and properties 
is that Aquinas would not claim that God has any properties since he views properties as accidents that inhere in a substance, which would by definition defy simplicity. Rather, God is said to have attributes or divine names, whereas properties inhere in a substance, making them accidents, attributes or names simply describe God in various ways and do not give his attributes or names the ontological status of a property. Regarding the various names or attributes, Aquinas states that due to the way in which we know God, namely from effects to cause, we do not know him directly or in himself. Rather, we know him indirectly and imperfectly. Further, the perfections that exist in creatures pre-exist in God as their cause only perfectly. We indeed pick out the various perfections that creatures imitate regarding God. However, given our noetic powers, we must of necessity describe God in various ways and from composed things. However, in God himself, he is simply one. Thomas declares, quote, As therefore to the different perfections of creatures, there correspond one simple principle represented by different perfections of creatures in a various and manifold manner. So also to the various and multiplied conceptions of our intellect, there corresponds one altogether simple principle, according to these conceptions, imperfectly understood." Unquote. In other words, the attributes or names we apply to God are really different in the way in which we mean them. However, they don't pick out really distinct properties in God. Rather, they describe the infinite being of God in different ways. Such a construal is necessary given the way we know him, namely through effects. It is important to note, however, that the different names we give to God are conceptually different, but there is a foundation in God for these different names. So while power, knowledge, and goodness are not definitionally the same, there is basis in God for our picking out these different characteristics. In other words, all of the different names pick out the way in which God is. However, such does not militate against divine simplicity since we as composed beings cannot comprehend the divine essence or describe him fully with a single name. In God, he is completely, perfectly, and infinitely powerful, knowledgeable, and good. But rather than picking out really distinct aspects of God, these terms simply describe his infinite being. There is not something in God that is called power and another thing called knowledge. These are not various things in God. They are simply the perfect being of God expressed in various ways since we must know and ascribe him with various perfections. What is important to understand regarding this issue is the nature and use of language regarding our descriptions of God. Aquinas argues that we cannot use univocal or equivocal language in reference to God. Our language must be analogical, meaning there is an aspect of our language that does not have the exact or completely different meaning when those terms are applied to a creature and to God. For Aquinas, this is because being itself is analogical. Being is not a genus since all being is not the same. Finite created being simply is not the same as infinite uncreated being. As Kant said, existence is not a predicate. Finite created things do not exist in the same way as their creator. So when we predicate certain perfections to God, we have some similar notion in mind regarding how that perfection relates to creatures. But Thomas argued that when applied to God, a given perfection is not exactly meant in the same way. Thus, knowledge, goodness, and power pick out certain aspects of finite creatures. However, we cannot think that God is simply a greater being in a quantitative sense. He is altogether different and distinct. Thomas maintains that God is qualitatively different. This notion of analogical language can even be seen in how terms are used of finite things. When I say my computer is good, my steak is good, or a person is good, I really don't mean the same thing in an exact way. They all have something in common regarding goodness and that calling something good means that it is a good member of its species. To be a good computer means that we have some good notion of what a computer should be like and that mine has those qualities. When we say a steak is good, we mean that in order to be good, steaks have to have certain qualities. When we say that a person 
is good. We mean we have some notion of what a person should be like and that this particular person actually is like that. The problem is God is not in such a species in order for us to know what he is like exactly. We don't even know what angels are like. Our knowledge of our language of angels is largely negative as well. We can say angels are immaterial, ah, temporal, and the like, but we don't have direct knowledge of them. Further, when we say angels have power or knowledge, we shouldn't think that their power or knowledge is just like ours. They are indeed immaterial beings that do not know through sense perception. Thus, human knowledge and angelic knowledge cannot be entirely the same. In other words, such terms must be used analogically. If our language of finite created beings, such as angels, must be analogical due to our ignorance of their nature, a fortiori, our language must be different for an unlimited infinite being. Another objection to simplicity stems from God's knowledge. Some object that God's knowledge of temporal things itself must be temporal in order to really call it knowledge, since the objects of knowledge are temporal and changing. Also, it is objected that God's knowledge should be different in possible worlds that have different objects to be known. For example, it is said we can imagine a possible world in which God did not create, and we can imagine another world in which he did create. Such differences regarding the contents of those worlds would seem to cause God's knowledge to be different. And if his knowledge is different, then it can't be simple. To such objections, there are several lines of response. First, Thomists have a radically different view of what it means for God to know. Given there is no passive potency for God to receive knowledge, his knowledge is active, not passive. He does not, quote-unquote, look outside himself, or as James Dolezal says, stand before a range of possibilities. In fact, given simplicity, his knowledge is no different from his existence and essence. Further, with the exception of some analytical Thomists, many, especially existential Thomists, often eschew possible world semantics. I do not intend on offering a full critique of that scheme right now, but it should be noted that Thomas generally, again with some exceptions, do not think the possible world scheme accurately captures what it means for God to possibly do or know something. Given that all he knows, he knows by virtue of knowing himself, possible worlds don't really fit in the Thomistic system, at least not for God. God's knowledge is causative, not passive. Another objection along the same lines as the previous one is that if God is simple, eternal, immutable, and necessary, then what God wills, he wills necessarily. There are no possibilities for God if simplicity is true, since his will is identical with his nature, which is also necessary. Hence, his will is necessary. Such has been termed the modal collapse, since according there would be no real possibilities for God to exercise. Hence, all that is willed is done so necessarily. Like previous objections, this is not exactly new, and Aquinas anticipated it and responded to it. However, before giving that response, let's assume the modal collapse objection is sound, and that whatever God wills, he does so necessarily. Such an objection, even if successful, does not seem to disprove divine simplicity as much as it proves fatalism. While fatalism is certainly an unwanted conclusion, that, that is no reason in itself to reject simplicity as it does not demonstrate complexity in God or show the incoherence of simplicity. However, there are responses to such an objection. Aquinas denies that there is any compulsion in the divine essence to create anything at all, let alone certain things. He makes a distinction between absolute necessity and suppositional necessity. Absolute necessity is characterized as more of an analytic or definitional necessity, such as when the predicate of a statement is contained in the subject, such as man is an animal. Also, notions like the whole is greater than the parts would be absolutely necessary. Another notion of absolute necessity is when something simply must happen with no other option on the table, such as God willing his own goodness. Suppositional necessity contains no such necessity. Supposing something is the case, it is necessarily, it necessarily is for as long as it is. For example, if Socrates sits, he necessarily sits for as long as he sits. However, there is no compulsion for Socrates to sit. 
Aquinas applies this to God, saying, quote, Accordingly, as to things willed by God, we must observe that He wills something of absolute necessity. But this is not true of all that He wills. For the divine will has a necessary relation to the divine goodness, since that is its proper object. Hence, God wills His own goodness necessarily, even as we will our own happiness necessarily, and as any other faculty has necessary relation to its proper and principal object. For instance, the sight to color, since it tends to it by its own nature. But God wills things apart from Himself, insofar as they are ordered to His own goodness as their end. Now, in willing an end, we do not necessarily will things that conduce to it, unless they are such that the end cannot be attained without them, as we will, we will to take food to preserve life, or to take ship in order to cross the sea. But we do not necessarily will things without which the end is attainable, such as a horse for a journey, which we can take on foot, for we can make the journey without one. The same applies to other means. Hence, since the goodness of God is perfect, and can exist without other things inasmuch as no perfection can accrue to him from them, it follows that his willing things apart from himself is not absolutely necessary, yet it can be necessary by supposition. For supposing that he wills a thing, then he is unable not to will it, as his will cannot change." End quote. In other words, God wills himself necessarily, but he only wills other things by supposition. That is, supposing he wills them, they are necessarily willed. So there is a sense in which things are necessary, but only because God wills them. He does not will them because they are necessary. So then why does God will some things and not others? Aquinas denies that there is any cause beyond God's will for why he wills things. There is no necessity in his nature to will them, and there is no necessity in the effects either. Regarding this last point, Aquinas declares, quote, Whatever implies no contradiction is subject to the divine power, as we have proved. Now many things are not among those created, which nevertheless, if they were, would not imply a contradiction, as is evident chiefly with regard to number, the quantities and distances of the stars and other bodies, wherein if the order of things were different, no contradiction would be implied. Wherefore, many things are subject to the divine power that are not found to exist actually. Nor, rather, now, whoever does some of the things that he can do and does not others acts by choice of his will and not by necessity of his nature. Therefore, God acts not of natural necessity, but by his will." End quote. He further concludes that since some effects are brought to be and not others, this demonstrates that there is nothing in the effects themselves that require their existence. So according to Aquinas, there is no natural necessity from God to create and no absolute necessity in the effects that he creates. This is evident in that he has created some things and not others. If there is no such necessity in effects to be created and no natural necessity on God's part, then these effects are simply willed freely by God. So there is a sense in which that God wills, that what God wills is necessary, but it is only necessary because God wills them, not because He must will them. There is nothing acting on God to create or to create certain effects. If God eternally wills a thing to be, it will be willed necessarily, eternally and immutably. Much of this discussion hinges on whether we can use terms like will in a univocal way between man and God. It is often the case that philosophers and theologians anthropomorphize God and try to explain what He is like based on what we are like. Thus, to describe what it means for God to have free will, people often look to what it means for man to have free will. However, such univocal language is problematic. Man's free will means that he can deliberate and choose, which is something an eternal, immutable being cannot do. Of course, this position takes God to be eternal and immutable, which is debated. As James Dolezal maintains, that God cannot alter his will is not a weakness in him, as it would be in us. As composite and contingent creatures, it is fitting 
that our volitional freedom consists in the power to will counterfactuals. But our free willing must function in the context of our ontological mutability and contingency. Such a freedom for God would actually signal a weakness in Him inasmuch as it would make Him dependent upon accidental acts of volition with which He is not strictly identical in order to actually possess the will He possesses. In other words, He would not have His will entirely in and through Himself. In short, <clears throat> Excuse me. In short, in responding to the modal collapse, we can make the following observations. One, it does not really seem to disprove simplicity since it only says an uncomfortable conclusion would follow and does not demonstrate divine complexity. Two, it fails to make important distinctions regarding types of divine necessity. And three, it hinges on univocal language and anthropomorphisms that cannot be applied to God if He is eternal and an immutable being. It seems that much of the disputes around divine simplicity reduce to metaphysical differences. Divine simplicity is, after all, based on metaphysical systems that arise from Aristotle and Plato. Thus, if one rejects these metaphysical starting points, one is also likely, if not guaranteed, to reject divine simplicity. I hope this paper has succeeded in demonstrating that thinkers like Aquinas realize the objections that have been leveled against divine simplicity and that he has offered reasonable responses to them. Thank you. At the SBL conference last year, there was a, a section on the Shema, and I argued that uh, divine simplicity, uh, Trinitarianism, uh, has an easier job of defending the orthodoxy of, of, of the statement of the Shema, the unity of God, than, than does a composite God. However, I think it's also the case that uh, the point that uh, Stephen Davis made is that it, it, it does seem to have a harder time dealing with the threeness of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So, uh, in a sense, it's a double-edged uh, question. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think the others will probably have something more substantial to say on this particular point. I, I, I was uh, delighted to see a book that I bought today, but I haven't read, uh, titled Divine Simplicity by Jordan Barrett. I don't know if you're familiar. But interestingly, he advances the argument that this, this doctrine of simplicity that we call Thomistic is, is actually dovetails better <coughs> with a traditional Orthodox view of the Trinity Oddly, he's saying the exact reverse, and so I'm interested in what his thesis is. If anybody's read it, perhaps you can. But it seems to me, at least, there's a sense in which the doctrine of simplicity, and perhaps maybe even simplicities other than Aquinas's, as you were suggesting, you weren't necessarily rejecting simplicity as such, but this particular. It seems to me a, a doctrine of simplicity is the safest guard against Trinitarian theology from collapsing either into tritheism or to sort of a partialism. I mean, it, however that cashes out, it seems it's precisely because God is not made of parts that it doesn't allow the doctrine of the Trinity to collapse the members of the Trinity from being parts and also from being three different gods since there's only one God as the doctrine of simplicity is closely connected to two. Um, I thought that Brian was uh, far too... Um, shall we say, cavalier in his dealing with this problem of the Trinity. He says those who held to simplicity, such as Augustine, Aquinas, Anselm, uh, did not see an obvious problem with the two being compossible. Well, they most certainly did see a huge problem with that, and they were uh, constrained, especially in Aquinas's case, to reinterpret the persons of the Trinity um, in a, in a, what I think is a desperate attempt to make it consistent with divine simplicity. For Aquinas, the persons of the Trinity are subsistent relations within God. Um, the relation between, or the distinction between the Father and the Son is rather like the distinction between I and me. Uh, I is the subject thinking, me is the object of, of my thought. Uh, and clearly, 
the notion of a subsistent relation is not robust enough to capture what we mean by a person. But it's actually worse than that, I think, because to say that there are subsistent relations within God is to violate the doctrine of divine simplicity. God isn't supposed to stand in relations. And so I think it's a fairly acknowledged problem among Thomists that I've read that there's nothing in Aquinas' metaphysic that would justify uh, the claim that his doctrine of divine simplicity is consistent or compossible with there being these different subsisting relationships within God. So I, I think something needs to be more said about that, Brian. Oh, thank you. So I had to truncate that session because I wanted us to focus more on other, other objections in my paper, and I wanted to say more about that, but then I couldn't have time. But I appreciate the um, response to it. What I meant by that was that they didn't think that there was a problem such that they had to reject divine simplicity. They certainly had to reconcile their views of the Trinity with their views of simplicity. But my point in, the, in that admittedly truncated and, and fast section was that they didn't see a problem in, in terms of a contradiction. And so they, they, would, they did have to kind of cash out these, these positions. In fact, Aquinas maintains in his view of the Trinity that when he's talking about uh, persons, he uses the language of, of persons because of the creeds. He doesn't think that it's, it's wrong to use the term persons, but that it's kind of uh, just been in vogue to use that. And he wants to maintain the unity of the Trinity, I think as Richard has pointed out, uh, through simplicity to maintain that, that oneness. And that if we said that there are anything, there is anything in the Trinity that would, any, that would multiply any aspect of God's being, whether it be uh, well, anything ontologically in terms of, of his actual essence, then that would be unorthodox and it would violate what Aquinas at least thought was necessarily the case that God had to be pure act. That however we understand the Trinity, it can't violate what we seem to, to believe to be true based on, on general revelation about God being pure act and pure existence. And so yes, he did have to, as well as other people that, that Bill mentioned, had to understand and uh, make sense of and interpret, I guess, their understanding of the Trinity on the philosophical, theological level that would comport well with the, with the doctrine of divine simplicity. My main point there, in a rushed way admittedly, is that they didn't want to abandon divine simplicity because of their, their um, earnest to make it fit with the Trinity. That they still thought that their, their ways of doing it ultimately was a mystery that we can't ever, because we don't know the divine essence, we're not, we're not going to know what the Trinity is in and of itself. And so if we have commitments on this one side about God being pure act and commitments on this side about, about there being a Trinity, they, they have to, to be able to comport with each other. And they didn't see a problem at the level where they had to reject one over the other. That's what I mean. I'm not sure if that satisfies what you're looking for, or want me to say or not, but yes. Um, first of all, I want to say, Richard, I really liked your paper, and, and that and the whole discussion tonight underscores something that I have long believed, and that is that if you basically buy into uh, Aquinas' metaphysic, I think the doctrine of simplicity nicely follows. I think that's absolutely right. And for those of us who like a lot of Aquinas, but not all of it, it's, it's, it's a lot more difficult. Okay, I think that's the sort of the light motif of the whole evening tonight. Okay, Brian, I want to ask you a question. Um, you began with the idea that God is pure act from Aquinas, which I entirely agree with. And you seem to argue that, that uh, Aquinas thought that it sort of necessarily followed from the fact that God is pure act, that God cannot be composite. And I just do not see how that logically follows, how the one follows from the other. Can you do more with that, please? Um, probably not that's going to satisfy your curiosity in the area because Aquinas, I'm sure you've read him already on that topic. Yeah. Well, if God is pure act, then there can be nothing that would delimit or differentiate one aspect of his being from the other, or there would be some kind of delimitation. There certainly couldn't be any kind of potentiality. And so what Aquinas wants to do in maintaining that God is pure act is saying that he can't have any of these other accidents of the categories, according to Aristotle, that would fit into his, his essence or being. And so I think what, what you're trying to maintain is, is that God being complex without being composite mm -hmm. is he can have these accidents. 
uh, in some way and still be pure act. Pure act. My understanding of, of both Aristotle and Aquinas is that if God really is pure act in an indivisible, infinite sense of being, once we, once we introduce an accident into that a notion of pure act, it's no longer pure act. That it somehow has a, um, a modification of its being that I think Aquinas would want to uh, reject because he thinks that there's, there has to be a, a, a being where we terminate our our um, looking to and for an answer cosmologically for all the existence of the universe. And if we say that he is com composed or complex, then Aquinas and Aristotle were at least going to say, well, then what put that complexity together? Now, I know it's not going to satisfy your... Yeah, question. it doesn't because it, nothing put it together if there are necessary aspects of God. But at any rate, let's go on to the, to the audience. Oh, uh, Rory Mishevitz, uh, Princeton Seminary. So I have a question about... I would like to push Brian a little bit further on uh, the mode of analogy. And so my question is this. So, so you use some uh, language like, um, you know, we have some sort of similar notion, some similar notion you said, which is supposed to be like anchoring our language here. And this is, th so th this is my main issue with Aquinas on this. Uh, as uh, Stephen said, perhaps it's entirely coherent at the end of the day. The problem is I don't understand how we can talk about a simple being intelligibly. So when I read about this in, you know, Thomas commentaries, they usually say that, okay, analogy works by either a sort of an analogy of attribution or an analogy of proportionality or some combination of those two mm -hmm. things. The analogy of attribution seems not to work because in some way you're kind of, you're right, you're, you're redounding uh, to a primary meaning. Uh, there's a secondary meaning for creatures. There's a primary meaning for God, right? So God is the source of... Uh, of goodness, or God is the source of, you know, whatever else it might be, whatever predicate you might want to put. The problem is, is that when you start using language of source or cause, you seem to be putting God into a class at this point, right, into a genus. So it's like, so okay, that, so that's not right. So, so you have to, it seems like then you have to go to proportionality. Okay, but if that's the, if, if we go to proportionality, then we have to have, it seems, some sort of continuum present in which to say, this works for God in this particular, or there's some sort of measure in which we can ascribe this predicate from creatures to God. Um, so then, but then, uh, uh, but then that again, it's, it's, there's a sort of, in, in, in establishing the continuum, you're putting, I guess, you're, you're not getting rid of the infinite qual qualitative distinction, which I, which I suppose is in place because of God as pure act. So I'm wondering, where, where do we go from there? Like, what, how, how would you, I suppose, make sense of this for me uh, with regard to the question of analogy more specifically? So what's my view of analogy, in other words? Yeah, like how question? would you... Okay. Well, as you probably already know, the, the doctrine of analogy, there, we really can't even say there is a Thomistic version because Thomists disagree on themselves as to what analogy is. As you've no, we don't. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> and so, you know, I think we're mostly, but not completely, in agreement that when we use language, um, we have to be careful not to over univocalize language. So we have somebody like on one hand, Batista Mondin, who wants to say that our, our concepts say the definitions are exactly the same. And somebody like Roca, Gregory Roca, who says, well, our concepts themselves are analogical. And I, I tend, where I am right now in my own personal thinking, tend to agree more with Roca. And I think I do that because, as I mentioned in my paper, when we say things about even finite beings, I can say that X, Y, and Z are good. But the notion and definition of good there has to somehow uh, comport and um, contract to the being in question. So to be a good podium and to be, a good, be, be good water are, are somewhat different because of the kinds of things they are. And so when we say positive predicates like God is good, God is being, God is wise, we, we mean by that there's some perfection in us uh, that God has to have, but has it uh, preeminently, completely void of any limitation or imperfection. And so I, I think that Aquinas is going to maintain a, a high level of agnosticism with, with the, uh, God's essence. And I think Roca maintains that in his view analogy, and I would, that's where I would go. I'm not sure if I'm getting your exact question or not, but I tend to maintain that, that the concepts that we apply to God uh, are, are even analogical, not just a predication, but that when I say that, that 
that this is good, that is good, and that is good, the notion of goodness is, is uh, defined in such a way that it, it, it's defined by its relation to what I'm referring to. So a horse is good in a different way than a computer is good. Well, if a human is good and an angel is good or different, then how much more are we going to say that, that God being good is similar but not exactly the same? Because we don't know what, what God is in terms of he doesn't, he doesn't have a genus or a species. So we say that X is good because we know what an X should be like. Like I know what a good horse should be, I know what a good pen should be like or a good cup of water. And I only have um, my knowledge through the effects as to what we have of God. And so we, we, we have to recognize that our language does say some positive things about God, but a lot of it we're just not going to understand. We don't have direct, sensible knowledge of God. Now, am I getting at your question and in, in answering it or not really? Uh, Somewhat? Okay, okay. If, if I may, too, the, the, the specter of agnosticism has come up several times, and I, I'm not so sure we should be so afraid of the, the dangers. It's just really the degree to which I think we're willing to admit. I, I don't know any Christian personally who wouldn't admit that they don't fully comprehend God. Well, that's just an, another way of saying there's a certain level of unknown about God, which is what the word agnosticism means. So uh, not, it didn't happen tonight necessarily, but I have seen people who, who think because Aquinas' view uh, necessarily entails a certain degree of agnosticism with respect to God's being, that somehow that's, a, that's something to be uh, uh, avoided. I just go, who doesn't have some level? Another thing that I think that confuses the conversation, it, not necessarily again tonight, is, is uh, what Aristotle and Aquinas even mean by the word no. So when we talk, of, when he says that we can't know God, well, for rightly or wrongly, both Aristotle and Aquinas thinks all knowledge begins in the senses. That it's not possible to talk about anything apart from the categories of the sensible world. Now, he may be that may be a bad procedure, but that is what they think the word no means. Building on that, he thinks that knowing is the, is the first act of the intellect whereby it abstracts the form of the sensible object. But if God is not a sensible object and he doesn't have a form, then the intellect can't, can't abstract that. Just by definition, then it's not known. But to not know something about God for Aquinas doesn't mean that there aren't true statements about God that can be, be made. It just means... He, we don't have the form of God that informs my intellect the way the form of a horse would inform my intellect as I have the first act of the intellect encountering the horse. And then when it comes to the question of existence, even in Aquinas, it's a different act of the intellect that perceives the existence of the thing, what he calls judgment. The problem, if, the, if you can call it a problem, what complicates the conversation, even in Aquinas, I think, is that once, once the judgment is made, the act of the intellect that perceives the being of a thing as, a part of, as opposed to its essence, which is grabbed by the first act of the intellect through abstraction, once that's made, the intellect is only able to cash out all of the things it wants to say about existence by converting it into a concept. Because that's the, that's the fodder in which intellects work. So now from... From the very first encounter with a sensible being, all discussion about existence will always talk about existence as if it's just a thing in these things rather than an act. And I think that's what sometimes precipitates some of the uh, criticisms of Aquinas as being, well, this really doesn't make sense. I think it's because, well, it's not really being appreciated in terms of why he's doing what he's doing. Now, again, I had the easiest task tonight which is like when your parents say, okay, we got some chores and here's a bunch of chores. Who wants to do it? I'll rake the leaves because you don't want to clean up the dog poop, right? So when it was, we were bending around, well, what, what's everybody want to do? I'll do the antecedents because I'd already written on this some, but I wanted to explore it more. But I had the easiest task of going, well, given his metaphysics, simplicity is pretty, pretty, pretty good. But then that... I'm not strapped with the task of having to defend the metaphysics necessarily. That, I mean, necessarily. I mean, now I will. Uh, now one of them is going to ask me. But anyway, at, at least in terms of the metaphysics of what's going on, I think that's what makes the conversation about analogy and these kind of things as complicated as it is for us today. So, Richard, I want to go a little bit further, further on this agnosticism point. One of the things that has always bothered me about Aquinas is a point that Aquinas makes strongly, we understand why he makes it, and that has been pretty much accepted 
by Christian theology ever since, and that is we know nothing about God in God's essence. Okay, I, I don't think that's true, and here's why. Uh, suppose we make a distinction between God as revealed and God in, in God's essence. Now, how do we make a bridge from one to the other? Especially in the light of the most radical critique of that we've got in the history of philosophy, and that's Descartes' evil genius hypothesis. Descartes hypothesizes that um, God is really a God who loves to fool us and makes us believe certain things like this is a glass of water, when really it's a very, 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 very cleverly disguised Volkswagen or something like that. I think it's something almost like that that, that Descartes has in mind, as ridiculous as that, as that sounds. Now, every Christian believes that what God has revealed to us preeminently in Scripture and in Christ reflects accurately God in God's essence. But in the light of Descartes' thesis, um, I don't know a way to build a bridge from God as revealed to God in God's essence. Karl Barth wrestled with this, and he basically said in the end, that's just not something we can know anything about. That's none of our business. Luther was very worried about this because he was afraid that, that he had been taught that God is loving and will forgive you, but he thought that God really maybe was going to punish him because he was such a bad guy. Okay, how do we make a bridge from one to the other? I'm inclined to think that in Revelation we can know at least something about God in God's essence, and so we don't need a bridge. Now, maybe I've gone way off into left field, but it's Aquinas that first started me thinking along those lines. Well, um, just to repeat a point I made a while, uh, just a while ago, when, when he says we can know nothing of God's essence, understood in the terms of what Aquinas means by the word know, mm -hmm. he means that there's no form in the being of God that the intellect can abstract and be informed by, as you would a sensible object. But he doesn't mean you couldn't know things that are true about God's essence, otherwise it's self-refuting. Because for him to say, well, you can't know anything about God's essence, well, do you know you can't know anything about God's essence? Well, then it's a self-refuting statement. But he, he's, he certainly didn't mean you couldn't say things that are true about God's essence. True. It just means, I think he means, in the Aristotelian sense of what it means to know an object, that's not our, what we have in our connection with God. Those what things are analogically have, true. Well, but what we do have, I think he would argue, is the argument of from effect to cause. So that we, the, as Paul says in Romans 1.20, the in, it's a quirky language in Paul's, uh, the way he says it, the invisible attributes of God are clearly seen through the things that are made. Yeah, Christians definitely believe that. Yeah, that's right. Paul. Yeah, that's right. That's that's Paul. That's right. That's, that's Paul. But, but uh, Christians definitely believe that. But what I'm asking is, can that argument overcome the evil genius hypothesis? Oh. Can, can that argument overcome the evil genius hypothesis? The evil genius could easily have set up something like that. Yeah, this, this, this is a great question. I love it because my students bring these kind of questions up too. And I think it's because... The, the problem that the evil genius poses is something that's pre-philosophical. So I agree, no, this isn't some postulate that could, quote, answer the, pre, the evil genius postulate because our knowledge of the external world is, is, a, is a human experience. It's not a philosophical doctrine. Mm -hmm. So as, as uh, and I'm being very partisan in my Thomism here because I'm a disciple of, uh, of Jill Sons. Mm -hmm. And so... Like, this is the subject of methodical realism, for example, Gilson's methodical realism. And he just says, the very postulating of the question that Descartes poses is to already uh, conclude idealism. Postulating the legitimacy of the question about whether what we experience in the first act of the intellect of the experience of the external physical world, just pausing that as a question that itself needs to be subjected to philosophical critique is to already decide the question in, in, in favor of idealism. I don't think there is a philosophical answer to Descartes in that respect. There may be other things I can say, but not, not necessarily in the thing which... Now, I think that, Richard, and what you're saying, you're just digging yourself deeper and deeper into the hole. Well, it wouldn't be the uh, first time. <laughs> <laughs> It needs to be understood uh, clearly on Aquinas' view, as Richard says, it is impossible for us to form a conception of 
God. Because I, that's as the, not what I said, though. Well, you said we cannot conceptualize the divine essence. No, in fact, I, I, I would say the opposite in this respect, that what we cannot do is the intellect can't abstract God's form. Okay. But, but the intellect can never fail to ultimately talk about things of existence in conceptual terms. Well, so I was we going do to form- get to that. Yeah. Um, so because we grasp things by grasping their essence or their form, and God doesn't have that. He just is the pure act of being. Thomas admit that God is incomprehensible. You, you, the intellect cannot grasp the pure act of being. And these statements, then, that we predicate about God aren't univocally true. They're only analogically true. And without a univocal element, they're, they're empty. Um, Brian, in, in Brian's paper, he says, when I say my computer is good, my steak is good, or a person is good, I don't really mean the same thing in an exact way. They all have something in common regarding goodness. And that is what you cannot say with respect to God on Thomism, because there isn't that univocal element. Um, in the end, these predications are empty. So, in general, of course, Aquinas affirms these sorts of things, but the question is, is he justified in affirming these sorts of things? And it seems to me that his metaphysic undermines um, these statements about God whereby we would like to say that God is truly good and truly not a deceiver and, and so forth. I know you guys have been raising all kinds of issues here, so I just don't know where to begin. You know. But um, <laughs> Take the uh, weakest with one. the last question, you see, I think you're assuming that somehow, unless we can talk about in univocal language, mm-hmm. God does not make any sense. And by univocal language, obviously, it's the kind of language that we acquire from the models of things in the world, you know, uh, w- with relations to you know, that obtain among creaturely things where there is successiveness and there is uh, uh, transience and uh, uh, all kinds of mutual, uh, re- you know, reciprocity and all those things, you see. So what, what you're ultimately saying, it seems to me, is that unless we can understand God in exact the same terms as we understand other human beings, then God doesn't make any sense, which means ultimately that you are creating God in your own image. We didn't say exactly I mean, the I'm same. I said there has to be a univocal yeah. element. Yeah. There has to be some element of univocity between our predicates of God and human, otherwise they're empty. Uh, and I think this is a point that Scotus saw oh, oh, in his wait, critique wait, of Aquinas. Okay, on okay. energy does not deny university, but right. its university is only one of the first steps that you make. So insofar as God is the creator of all things, God indeed left his images and traces in things God has created. And there is similarity, that is the ground of similarity. But at the same time, in a second step, we have to negate and purify our language of all that pertains only to finite material beings and so on, and then affirm him on on the third level, the via eminencia, you know. Mm -hmm. Now, at the level of quote, we do not know really what we are referring to precisely because that is the realm of transcendence, that's the realm of infinity and so on. Uh, so, I mean, obviously, so uh, in terms of uh, the, the principle of causality and uh, according to the principle that uh, somehow uh, the agent, you know, the pre- produces something similar to the agent himself. So there is similarity there and that is the basis of a common language about God. But we have to make sure that we do not use our language in exact the same way that uh, we can talk about other human beings and so on. So even though in the case of language, for example, God knows, we know, and so on. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, all the, the, the subsequent questions uh, after question three when uh, Aquinas talks about uh, immutability, eternity, and knowledge, and so forth, obviously he's using a uh, a kind of definition of what it means to know and so on, but uh, always is trying to purify it of the kind of uh, uh, the, the, the traces of finitude so as to be able to apply to God without necessarily saying that he knows what he's talking about. He points to God. And so there is an element of uh, 
that is a real transcendence. You know. But I think the the important thing about analogical predication of divine names is that in the second moment, moment of pure negation, negation of material properties and finite properties and so on, uh, that is a guard against turning God into another kind of anthropomorphic figure. And at the same time, in the third moment, you, you elevate, you, you affirm God again without perhaps knowing exactly what it is that you are affirming. But isn't that precisely what our situation is like in relation to God? Can you claim that you know God like your father? Uh, obviously, you know, when God knows, uh, is rather radically different from the way we know things. It takes time for us to know anything. We can change our knowledge and so on. We can be conditioned by our, our material situations. We can be conditioned by the kind of teachers we had, there, all those things. But obviously, all these finite conditions don't apply to God. And so, it, you know, the, uh, uh, okay, that's just, a, just one aspect of, uh, of the problem why we cannot simply insist on university alone, in which case we are reducing God to merely an anthropomorphic figure. Uh, and then we put, make, not at the micro, and then we make one more uh, uh, statement here. Uh, about, uh, I, I think it re refers to what uh, Steve was talking about, uh, but uh, you know, you were talking about uh, the, the, how we have to avoid uh, being too transcendent and being too imminent and so on. But what exactly is the criterion by which then you distinguish between too transcendent and too imminent there? Doesn't it have to do with God's own being? You know, God is a yeah. kind of being, right? Absolutely. Now, I think the whole point of simplicity, where, where at the end Aquinas defines God as ipsum as a subsistence, you see. Uh, that alone shows how God is truly a creator, you know. What does creation mean? Creator means to bring things into being from nothingness. And what kind of being can bring anything into being at all unless it is very, your, your very essence is to be, you know, your very essence, mm -hmm. just as unless your very es you, you, you have an essence to be, unless you are wise, you cannot produce any kind of wise things. Unless you are intelligent, you cannot produce any intelligent ordered, uh, you know, schemes of things and so forth. So according to this kind of notion of proper causality, God, precisely because in God there's no distinction between essence and existence, rather God's very essence is to be. God alone can create. Now, that also leads to the other thing, is that that alone, it seems to me, also what, what makes God's revelation possible, like the incarnation, you know. You know, human beings cannot incarnate themselves in anything else, you see. The only thing we can do is to produce a paper in which you incarnate, you incarnate part of your knowledge and so forth. But you can never incarnate, uh, uh, you know, your per, you know uh, a, incarnate yourself in a uh, personally united form in something other than ourselves. Whereas God alone, precisely because, okay, I'm sorry. No. <laughs> Uh, okay, I'm I'm going to, but yeah. Uh, what I'm I'm trying to say is that uh, it is precisely because God is the fullness of being. God not only can create, God also can become incarnate and assume a human nature as something as His own, you know, which no human being can do. So I mean, if you don't like the language of being and so on, you have to find some other way how you know creation is possible, how incarnation is possible. And even revelation, it seems to me. Okay. Let's see, um, Anselm, I'm not sure I quite got that. Could you repeat it for us? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. You, got, you, got, you people don't know this, but Anselm and I are Claremont colleagues, and we argue back and forth a lot about, about these sorts of issues. Um, I'm just going to point out first that I agree with probably maybe 95% of what you said. I liked it a lot. Okay. I want to point out that there's a distinction between two different questions here. One is, can we speak univocally about God? Another question is, the one I was addressing, can we know anything about God's essence? Those are two different, different questions, although obviously they're related, but they're two different questions. Forgive me if my question seems a little bit uh, naive. I'm still a student, and I'm at the beginning, very much at the beginning of my philosophical and theological journey. But everything that you have presented, I want to thank you. It's helped me 
learn a lot more and clarify a lot more things. I have a question actually for both sides which will further help clarify some of the thoughts that I'm having. And um, to this side here of divine simplicity, uh, we mentioned a lot about the analogy of language and how we use that to describe God. My question is, how are we in ourselves similar to God? Unless I'm misreading the way in which God created us, the image and the likeness, it doesn't seem to be that we were made to describe things that are similar to the way God would describe, but that we are very much made made in the image, so that our being somewhat is also analogous. So I'm confused into how you would say a human being is simple, analogously. Is that making sense? Uh, so forgive me again if my question is very naive. And to the other side, I guess, if I was to accept your uh, presuppositions and, and, uh, and ontology there, in what ways am I different from God? Is it just in terms of measure? So I have power to do things, but God is, um, he has the power to do everything. Can I know things, but God knows everything? Is it just the degree to which I'm different? How exactly are we different? Well, simplicity is one of them. I mean, God is simple and we're not. That's one of the biggies. Okay. I mean, uh, 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 I mean, uh, but, but so I would in say what sense do you mean that God is simple? Because I thought you're saying that he's has complexity to him. Yeah, I was raise, raising that as an objection to the Thomistic notion of simplicity. Some version of simplicity is going to be... So if God is complex, then in what way are we different, I guess? That's what I'm asking. And if, and if God is simple, in what ways are we the same? Does that make sense? I'm I would sorry. think one of the clearest ways in which we are different from God is that he exists necessarily and we exist contingently. Um, in, in other respects, you're right. We only differ qualitatively from God. Uh, we have finite, limited knowledge. He has unlimited knowledge. We have a little bit of power. He is omnipotent. That would seem to be a mere qualitative, uh, or maybe I should say quantitative difference. But when it comes to necessary being versus contingent being, then these are, are radically different. But we both exist. There is that element of univocity. Um, we both have being. And the, the thing that deeply concerns me about the Thomistic view is that um, we can't know anything about the divine essence. Um, it's, it's unintelligible. It's not that we can't comprehend it in the sense of grasp it in its entirety. We all admit that. But at least we can grasp some univocal elements of it. Specifically, I wanted to address the fact in what way are we the same in terms of when you were describing God's will, our will seems to be very much different than his will, the way in which it works. When you describe his freedom, our freedom is very much different to the way his is. I forget, there were a few other things that you mentioned and everything is different, 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 different. I'm wondering in what way are we similar? Yeah, I don't disagree with, with Bill that we have existence in common. I would just say that the kind of existence is qualitatively different because we have uh, participated finite existence where God just is existence and so it, it, I think it's, it's more than a quantitative difference it's also a qualitative we're also intellectual beings like God is God has an intellect again we, we wouldn't think that it's the same because God being an eternal immutable being our intellects change and they're in time and, and they're, they're, they're passive in that regard where God is not passive he's, he's more active and causative um, and you want to add something to that well, well no I mean one thing as, as Brian already said the the whole issue of analogy is, is even controversial among Thomists. So uh, I'm, I don't think there's any way we're going to settle that debate. Because there are some Thomists that would grant a university of concept and then analogy of predication like Batista right. Mondin would right. do, for example. So you've got Bons, uh, uh, Klubertans or Mondin or some people on one end of the spectrum and then Gregory Roca uh, on the other. Would um, everybody agree with something that has always been obvious to me, that there has to be something unequivocal in every analogy. Well, I think that's part of the dispute in this respect, because I think somebody like Aroka, and I haven't finished his book, would say that, that to say that I have an analogy <coughs> of a concept is not to say that my knowledge is equivocal, meaning it's absolutely different. In other words, that's what analogy is, that it's similar 
which is not the same as exactly the same, univocal, and exactly different, equivocal. It's, it's neither of those, it's similar. Well, to, to, to point out that it's not univocal is just to point out that analogy isn't univocity. Well, yeah, it isn't univocity. But, to, but that doesn't prove in, by itself to say that uh, an, anal 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 an analogical concept is not knowledge because an analogical concept is not univocal is itself part of the, dis the dispute about the function and place of analogical language. So you may be right about that. I, I, jury's still out with me only because of my, the, uh, the sort of, I don't know enough about it yet to, to make a judgment. I, I have a sincere question that I'd like to ask that puzzles me. Um, if with ordinary predications with regard to creatures, there's a kind of metaphysics of property ascription. For example, if I say Steve is um, a philosopher, or if I say Steve uh, has 10 fingers or something, um, that this is um, an ascription of properties to Steve, like being 10 fingered or being a philosopher. Why, in God's case, is it consistent to abandon that metaphysics of predication and to say, say that in God's case we can have true predications of God without property ascriptions? I, I mean, I see how that's required by simplicity, but it seems ad hoc. If you, if you have but a it's theory more than, it's of not just predication... I'm sorry. If you have a theory of predication that involves property ascription, then why aren't the true predications of God the ascription of properties to yeah, him? Yeah, well, uh, properties for Aquinas are not, that's not even the same word that, he doesn't mean the same thing than we would mean typically when we talk about properties. To say that Steve has five fingers, we just call, a, sometimes we assign the word property to a statement that is true about a thing. Whether property is picking out something metaphysical that's something other and distinguishable from Steve himself, that can, you know, you can have that conversation. But for, for uh, properties in Aquinas are gonna be, actually, you're gonna have to distinguish between proper accidents and accidents. So you've got genus, specific different species, proper accidents and accidents. So what Aquinas is trying to deny is that there are either proper accidents or accidents in God in a way that ultimately simplicity will, will not allow. But it doesn't mean that he, he doesn't think we can say things that are true about God. So I'm not sure what... Well, that's what, that, that's what I don't understand, Richard. If when I make true predications of Steve, like Steve is good or something, that involves a substance and accidents that involves composition in Steve, right. then why isn't it ad hoc to say that when I make true predications of God, that suddenly it doesn't involve substance and accidents. Because Again, reason, I see that simplicity requires it, but it seems like ad hoc, you've abandoned your theory of predication. Yeah, the, I think the reason is, the short answer is because when you predicate a, a property to Steve, both Steve and the property exist. So the existence of them can't just itself then be another thing about which you would talk about substance and accidents or properties. Otherwise, you're implying those things exist. And it starts this infinite regress. He's trying, rightly or wrongly, to say, what is this, what is this quality or, or attribute or whatever, this truth about all things that we call existence? Well, itself, it itself can't be just merely a property about a substance because to say that uh, this substance has this property is to already admit that the substance and the property both have existence. But if the substance and the property both, because if they don't exist, you wouldn't make the statement. If they do exist, then what about the existence of the substance and the property? Does that existence itself have properties? Well, what about the properties of the properties of that? And it starts this infinite infinite regret. So what I think he's, it's not so much that it's required by simplicity, I think simplicity is just sort of the, what sort of falls out. Once he's tried to say what he thinks it is about existence, what is it about things that by virtue of which we make, we call them real? That's something that 
in my, it seems to me, is something that, the, the way Aquinas answers that question is unique in the history of philosophy. Or I should say unique up to his points, not unique since then. Since everybody Thank you for a very engaging discussion. I've enjoyed it a lot. I'm Richard Rice. I teach at Loma Linda University in Southern California. I've taken as careful notes as I can, and I'm going to have to go home and study them at great length to follow some of the subtlety of the discussion. I hope the papers will be available <coughs> in published form, or some of yours will be available online so we can yes, study Yes, I will put it on my website okay. as soon as I take I a have a I have a simple question. Uh, I think it's probably simple-minded, so I, I, hope, uh, I hope I'm not betraying too, uh, too unsophisticated a knowledge, but I'm just wondering why is simplicity superior to complexity when it seems to me it's possible to think of each of those qualities in a kind of a, an excellent way. Uh, when we think of what makes a good parent, for example, we can think of ways in which a good parrot is changeless and ways in which a good parrot is changing. And we can think of bad ways in which a parent could be both. I think a, a good parent will be sensitive, a bad parent will be unreliable. Change involves in both. I, I, think, I think when it comes to changelessness, a good parent will no, be that's right. consistent, uh, but a bad parent would be, uh, what would you say, rigid and insensitive. So. I, I, it seems to me that you can emphasize a way in which God is simple that is uh, attractive and, uh, what would we say, generically excellent to a divine being, but it's also possible to think of God as, as uh, complex see, in the, ways the that surpass The motivation, I think, us. is not because simple is superior to complex, that's the first if, and then we think God is the most wonderful thing, then therefore he must be simple because we already, for other reasons, thought simplicity was somehow, it was better to be simple than to be complex. The causal arrows go in the wrong direction. What I think Aquinas is doing is saying, this is what I think God just is. And then from that, he begins to pick out what he thinks is superior to something else. So it's not that he picks out what he thinks is superior, simplicity over complexity, and then he ascribes simplicity to God because it's superior. He would only call simplicity superior because it reflects the nature of God. But his reason for thinking God is simple has to do with the fact that he thinks that there's no principle of differentiation within God's being. Because existence would just be the highest category in his metaphysics. So as he, as he resolves things back to, well, every, well, we've already gone through this, but as he resolves things back to there must be some cause of the existence of everything else in reality, and that thing must just be existence itself, because it can't be given existence if it's ase. say, then it, then it just is simple by, and, that's, and so the simplicity is more of a conclusion rather than some kind of motivation that he's trying to drive his metaphysics to, to uh, defend. Well, as, as you've articulated simplicity, it seems to me the qualities of God that give God religious significance are the ones that have to be extremely qualified in such a way yeah, that it's difficult. That, that's true. It's difficult it, to grasp. Again, them. it would be analogous to the, the the colors in the visible spectrum being all just white. But I mean, this is an analogy. But the fact that blue is not the same as green is doesn't it, is not entailed by the fact that blue, red, and green together just are white. We don't say, well, then that makes blue equal to green. No, it just means that in the, in the way the prism is, when the visible spectrum is diffused throughout the visible, the white light is diffused throughout the visible spectrum, we see it in all these different colors. So by analogy, Aquinas thinks existence, the act of existing that God just is by his very substance, when it's in, fact, in effect diffused throughout all finite reality, it just appears in this, in just this incalculable number of uh, properties and beauty and effulgence of colors and tastes and smells. And he just thinks that that's, that's just the way God it manifests his beauty through the things that he made. And I think that's what I take Paul to be hinting at in Romans 1.20. The invisible attributes of God are clearly seen through the As you've described it then, it sounds to me like God is generically excellent. 
in okay. a way that would correspond to his simplicity. And there's, you know, just to say simplicity is somehow elevated above complexity would not do justice to the way you've described his simplicity. Okay. okay. So, all right, thanks. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Oh. Yeah. oh, go ahead. Are we allowed to do that? Yeah. <laughs> all right, we'll take one more from the audience. Yeah. Uh-oh. Just, yeah. just, just to point out that uh, <laughs> with regard to simplicity and complexity, uh, we are not talking about uh, the simplicity of human affairs, of politics, and so forth. This is strictly a metaphysical term. And sure. all it, it is trying to say at the end is that God is not another finite being. <coughs> another, all finite beings are composed indeed. You know, essence exists, substance and accidents, material parts and so on. God is above all those things, you see. Uh, and so that is as a way of saying, as I think Steve pointed out, uh, it, it really a metaphysical way of saying God is truly transcendent. And uh, that's why the, the, Arctic, the question on simplicity is the, the beginning question in the Summa uh, with regard to all the other divine attributes and so on. Okay. Thank you. Am I good? Okay. Um, I have a quick question maybe for both of you, but Bill, if you could help me understand your position better. As I was doing my research on uh, the modal collapse, um, I was um, wondering how you would respond to um, how it would affect your position because you seem to maintain that God sans creation is eternal. Although I don't, you I, mean know, timeless. I know you don't, timeless, okay. Pardon, Pardon okay. me, you mean timeless. Timeless, okay. Yes. Right. Well, can you help me understand what you mean or what you would mean by saying God willed creation in a sense? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to clarify in my mind how does that not escape the modal collapse in your own position if, if God is timeless and God will have to will, so to speak. Does, does that in well, any way relate to, to the modal collapse? to be timeless is not the same as being immutable. Timelessness implies changelessness, but it doesn't imply necessity. There could be worlds in which God exists timelessly without any creation, and in this world he, he exists with a creation. There's, I don't see any connection at all between being timeless and some things being metaphysically necessary. Okay, I guess what I'm trying to get at is if God is timeless, then there's no before and after with his right. will, right? right. So then so God timelessly wills that there be a creation. Right, I'm trying to understand how you see the difference between timelessly wills on your model and eternally wills on our model. What would be the difference? My objection to God's will on your model isn't that it's eternally willed, mm -hmm. it's that it's necessarily willed. Because he's necessarily And I think that that's, something you didn't deal with adequately. The, um, what you argued using suppositional necessity is that we can have uh, the necessity of if God wills X, then X will happen. And that's necessarily true, that whole conditional. If God wills X, X will necessarily, or X will happen. But the point I think that we're trying to make is that on Thomism, it's not mere suppositional necessity. The antecedent is necessary. That God wills necessarily whatever he wills because his will is the same as his essence and therefore there is no possibility of willing otherwise. And that implies logical fatalism, as I said, and, that, and, and it denies that creation is a contingent act of God, denies that creatures exist contingently, everything becomes logically necessary. How, how so you, this idea of suppositional necessity just isn't going to avoid modal collapse. Okay, this is a different subject now. Do you not think God is necessary in his being as, as a timeless being? We do. I mean, both Steve and I yeah. want to affirm God's metaphysical necessity, but that doesn't mean that God in different possible worlds can't will differently, know differently, love different creatures. Whereas on Aquinas' view, since God is simple, he's absolutely similar in every possible world. He always wills the same, loves the same, knows the same. And so it's hard to see how there can be different possible worlds. And don't get hung up on possible worlds here. For me, that's just a heuristic device. Okay. 
I buy, I'm an anti-realist about possible worlds. Right, right. Um, <laughs> But it, it, it's, it's simply to say that on simplicity, it's impossible for God to, to will any differently than what he does will because his will is his essence. Okay, so the way you would escape that collapse in your, in your model is that his will is distinct from his necessary being? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that, that God exists necessarily, but he doesn't will what he wills necessarily. And especially, it's evident that he doesn't know what he knows necessarily, because he could have created different creatures in which he would, case he would have different knowledge. Like, had he created nobody at all, he would say, "I am alone. I have not." I, he would have the knowledge, "I exist alone. There are no creatures." Um, but it seems to me that on Thomism, um, because his knowledge is his essence, he can't know any differently than what he knows. You have to say that the same simple state of God could count as radically different knowledge and will in these uh, various scenarios. And as I said, I think then that, that strange Thomistic doctrine makes it inexplicable as to why creatures exist and differ as they do. I think you guys should just bite the bullet and be fatalists. I think there are creatures that it's inexplicable why they exist. <laughs> I don't think that gets me anywhere. <laughs> Any other comments among the panel? We got just a couple of minutes. Well, I'm just going to ask. Go ahead. Sorry. Were you going to say something? It seems like Aquinas is, is denying, though, that, that God wills anything of necessity, that he wills because he, he freely chooses to. But there's nothing in his nature that requires him to will. And I, I just don't see anything. He's a necessary being, and he, his will is identical to his essence. But why does that mean that he, what he wills, he wills of necessity, as opposed to choosing from all eternity, well, choosing in quotes, from all eternity, or willing from all eternity what he wills, and that making it necessary because he wills it, not, will it, not willing it because he's necessary? Well, to think of it in the simplest terms, what God wills would be an essential property of God. Now, I know you don't think that God has properties, but use that façon de parler that uh, it, it belongs to the very essence of God to will what he, in fact, is willing and couldn't have been otherwise. That leads then immediately to this kind of modal collapse. Let me say, in kind of a, as a concluding word, one of the things that I think is inadequate about the Thomistic response to many of these objections is that one will simply say, well, Thomas anticipated that objection, and here's what he said, and that's the end of the story. Um, whereas it seems to me in many cases what Thomas said was inconsistent with his own view, like the fact that he certainly does affirm that God could have willed and known differently. Uh, or that he does think that God is good and that God is omniscient. It, there's, it, it seems to me that it's not enough just to cite the proof text from Aquinas and say he's anticipated the objection because in many cases the response that he gives seems to me to be incoherent with this broader doctrine of God being the pure act of being. Does, does the, assuming we are fatalist, would that disprove simplicity? If, if, we, if, we, if we bite the bullet and become fatalist, would that be an would that, that would really? that would remove the modal objection or yeah. the modal collapse yeah. objection? Yeah. But Brian, you don't want to go there. I mean, I'm not, that, I'm not that's so there. radically <laughs> yeah, crazy. I'm not, I'm, not, yeah. <laughs> I'm not trying to go there. I'm just want okay. to understand. Even given that's the case, it doesn't seem like it's an objection to simplicity per se. Like well, I think it is because logical fatalism, I mean, it's so absurd and so un-Christian un and unbiblical. Yeah, I'm, I don't hold to it, obviously. I'm no, no, of course not. Yeah. But I mean, sometimes a person can say to an objection, well, I'll just bite the bullet and accept that consequence. But I mean, in this case, it's so, it's so insane that one just couldn't do that, I think, and, and come away... No, I agree with you, but it'll seem like you have to move beyond simplicity to make that point. That it doesn't disprove simplicity as such. So we can show its incoherence in other areas, maybe. It shows that but simplicity, simplicity leads to untoward consequences. You have to pull out other, other areas? Yeah, okay. yeah. 
<clears throat> sort of like a reductio ad absurdum. Yeah, yeah, that's it. I, I take you to be doing it. Yeah, please, uh,